Hello, PyCon, and welcome to the workshop on Django architecture for Microsoft Azure. My name is Anthony Shaw, and today we're going to go through a whole range of different topics over the next 40 minutes. Um, at the end of the talk and on every slide, there's a link to some resources we've put together, which have got information about everything covered today, as well as links to examples uh, and a sample project that we put together, which shows exactly how everything you'll see uh, can work in, in a production environment. So really, in terms of our, our agenda for today's talk, um, first of all, we're going to look at the Azure Web application architecture and I'm going to explain how Azure web apps really work and how they work in a Python context uh, and what's the best way to set it up for a Django application. Then we're going to look at deployment. So how do you get your Django application onto the Azure platform? What tips and best practices are there for running Django in Azure, uh, especially when it comes to things like performance and scalability? And also, how do we make sure that we can monitor and track everything that's going on with our app? With the scale, uh, I'll talk to you about really kind of the smallest configuration, uh, which could be like a dev test environment, or it could be something that's got, you know, a small number of users. So how do we scale that up um, and make that bigger, I guess, as we have more and more users on our app? And then we're going to look at how do we build out the right architecture to get to, you know, millions of users. So how really can you scale this application down from the smallest different the smallest part and how big can we scale it when we have um you know a big successful app in the future and we're also going to look at monitoring and how we implement monitoring both on the front end and on the back end services in terms of the outcomes from this talk after watching this talk you'll know what services are available to run a full django application I'm going to cover a bit recap of Django architecture and then really connect that back into uh, the Microsoft Azure stack and explain how the different components work together. We're going to look at cloud architecture for Django and how a Django application can be deployed on the cloud so that it's scalable. We're going to look at how you can deploy a Django application on the Azure platform, uh, either through an IDE using DevOps, uh, like a CI CD process. Um, from a private Git server, from a public Git server. So I kind of cover off all the different scenarios. Uh, and then last but not least, you'll know how to scale applications up and down depending on the workload. So for example, if you have a seasonal workload um, or you have a lot more users at the weekend, then we'll talk about how you can put that into effect. And then lastly but not leastly, you'll know how to set up monitoring and how to set up dashboards. So with the sample project that we've got in the link, uh, by the end of this talk, you'll understand how to put that sample project into production and have it ready for, you know, a wave of users coming. In terms of our expectations of what you maybe already know going into the talk, uh, we don't expect that you know Azure architecture. And I'll try my best to explain the different components as we go. Um, I'm assuming that you know Python and I'm assuming you know how to use an IDE. Uh, also, assuming that you know what Django is and the basic concepts of Django, this isn't a beginner Django tutorial. Um, if you are looking for that, then we've got some great examples we can link to as well. So I'm also assuming you're either building an application in Django or you have built an application in Django. So this uh, tutorial really isn't going to cover off what to build. Uh, I'm assuming that you already have something that you're working on or you've already deployed. Uh, and you're looking at different ways of getting that up and online. Uh, and, and again, if you want a Django tutorial, we've got one from previous years and also uh, there's some other great resources available for free that we can link to. Okay, so first step, let's talk about architecture. So just as a recap of the different components that make up a working Django application. So I don't just mean the Python code, I mean, if you've got a Django application that's running on a web server and it can respond to people over HTTP, they can see it with a browser, what components are in place to make that actually work? So the first things first is you'd need a HTTP server. Typically with Django architecture, you either have this done by something like Nginx um, or Apache, for example, the HTTPD with Apache, or, or even with a Windows server would be IIS. So this is the, I guess, the HTTP facing uh, endpoint. This isn't provided by Django. You have to 
use something else. And then the way that the HTTP server would talk to Django would otherwise be with the web server gateway or the asynchronous gateway uh, interface. Django does bundle the interfaces, but you still have to connect the two things together. So this layer would typically be done by something like G-Unicorn uh, or Uvicorn or Hypercorn. Uh, and these are actually worker processes that connect the HTTP server into Django. If you've ever had to deal with Django deployments before, maybe you have a flavor of this that you're used to or something you're familiar with. If you're still at the development stages and you're still working on the app locally and you're just running the dev server with Django, you haven't had to deal with this yet, but basically when you deploy to production, you need a HTTP server in place and you need a Whiskey server in place. I'll explain where they come in in terms of the Azure architecture as we go through this tutorial. Then you've actually got your Django app itself. This is something that you've built locally typically, um, and you've got a manage.py, you've got your settings file, and underneath that in Django, you've got things like Django middleware, you've got your views, your models, and also static files. So in Django, static files are really important. They might include things like CSS files, JavaScript, any images or, or, or additional components and stuff that need um, to, you know, that you need to get your app working. The way that Django deals with this is it offloads typically the static files onto the HTTP server. So if you have something like Nginx at the front end, typically you'd serve static files up through the front end app. And I'll explain how we can do that in Azure as we go through this talk. And then the next level down, we've got different pieces of middleware, um, maybe some that you already use like security middleware, monitoring middleware, uh, storage caching, for example. Within your views, you've got things like templates, and then underneath the models, you've got the ORM, which is what connects your models down into the database uh, via both the API that Django uses and also the migration files. And then the last thing you need to provide to get a working Django uh, application up is you need to provide some sort of database service. So we'll talk about that in a second. We'll get to databases. In terms of the Azure concepts that I th want to just go over quickly. Uh, the first one is quite straightforward. It's a subscription. So before you do anything in Azure, you need to be subscribed to Azure. That's your Azure account. Uh, sometimes you might even have more than one. You might have a, a work one and a personal one, for example, but you definitely need a subscription to, to get started with. The second thing is a resource group. Uh, resource group, you don't get charged for resource groups. It's just like a container, like a folder really, that helps you organize all the resources in your Azure subscription. So I recommend that when you're starting a new deployment or building a new app on Azure, the first thing you do is actually create a resource group with a logical name and then use that as the place to deploy all the different parts. And then lastly, you've got the runtime environment. So where does the actual application run? In terms of the architecture options for doing your actual Django application, really you've got two main options. One, which is the one that I recommend and the one we'll go through today is with app services. So app services are Linux virtual machines uh, that Microsoft offers as a fully managed service. So all you really have to do is deploy your code to app service and tell it how much compute you need, how much memory you need, and how many endpoints you would like and then it's all managed for you. So you don't have to worry about operating system patching. You don't have to worry about disk space, for example. So it's a fully managed service uh, and it's backed off onto Linux virtual machines, either Python 3.6 or the way up to Python 3.8. There are plenty of options available for you to scale both uh, horizontally and vertically. So if you want more power, but a fewer number of instances, you can do that. If you want more instances, then you can also do that so we can scale uh, out as well. And there's a lot less maintenance overheads because you don't have the operating systems to, to manage. So it's really an easier option for you if, you're, if you don't have an ops team or if you're not looking to manage uh, the infrastructure yourself. Also, there's usage-based pricing. So you pay per minute for the number of compute uh, nodes that you have. If you scale out, then you pay for that. If you scale back in again, then you would pay less. The other option is uh, to have a full virtual machine. So if you deployed a Linux VM or a Windows VM on Azure, 
you'd be responsible for configuring the operating system, doing all the security and also the patching uh, of the operating systems. I'd recommend this option if you have any non-standard requirements when it comes to either extra pieces of software that need to be on the machine or um, you've got something else in the application which means it's not compatible with app services. But I'd strongly recommend using app services because first of all, it's more cost effective. And secondly, there's a lot less for you to have to manage yourself. Okay, so let's talk about the Azure Web Apps. So some components that are, make up Azure App Services, I guess the main one is Web Apps itself. So when you go into Azure and you deploy a new web app, uh, it will really ask you a few things. It will say, okay, is this Linux or Windows? Which runtime are you looking to do? So if you pick Linux and then you pick Python, you have the choices of Python 3.6 up to 3.8, like I mentioned. Uh, 3.9 should be coming out soon as well. Um, and then once you've got that really, your goal is to deploy the code to the web app. So the web app itself is not the thing which runs the application. It's just the thing which holds the actual application configuration and the code itself. And then it runs the application on different instances. So it does that first of all through an app service plan, which is something that you pick when you do the deployment. Uh, the app service plan really controls um, which options you want. So if you just want a simple dev test environment, it scales everything down for you. If you want uh, SSL offload, if you want custom domains, SSL certificates, uh, load balancing, for example, then you can pick that as a plan as well. And then once you've done that, you then have a number of instances, anywhere from one up to 30. Uh, and these instances are actually the, uh, the containers basically that run your application. So the web app orchestrates deploying the code onto the instances and it also manages the runtime for you. So for Python, all you're looking at really is deploying a web app and then controlling how many instances of that application you want to run and what specification you need the instances to be. So in terms of instances, the smallest option is something called a B1. Uh, it's 1.75 gig of RAM and one vCPU. So this is good for dev test. Um, I wouldn't run a production workload on this because really for Django, you need at least a couple of gigs of RAM um, unless you've got something very, very straightforward. So I'd recommend something probably more like a P1 V2. In terms of the both the number of users and the complexity of the application, um, the more CPU you need and the more RAM you need, basically the bigger the instance. So you can have both more instances and bigger instances. So the biggest instance is a P3 V3. It's 32 gig of RAM and eight vCPUs. Um, so if you have a massive requirement, you can deploy up to 30 of those. And there's a lot of options in between. <laughs> uh, around 10, but it changes quite often. So yeah, I'll come to tips in a second, but I'd recommend kind of experimenting with different sizes until you get the right fit. So for a simple dev test environment, you just have the web app, which has the code. You have picked a dev test plan. So that kind of scales down the features for you. So you're paying uh, basically the least amount just to run that environment. Uh, and then you could deploy maybe just one B1 instance to run the code. You can have everything up and online. Um, you can test, do integration tests in your application. It's ideal for testing new features or new functionality uh, and running a separate isolated environment to do that. If you have a small production environment, then I'd recommend a similar thing, but introducing the production plan that would give you both uh, load balancing as well as custom domains and the ability to install uh, certificates. So, you know, if you want to run that then up on uh, your web application and you want the ability to scale that outwards, then the smallest production environment really is a P1v1 or a P1v2. I'd recommend something like a P1v2 for most Django applications in terms of the size. Um, it should be able to deal with uh, most things you could throw at it. And then if you do need to scale outwards, you could basically just scale horizontally by adding more instances to that production environment. So if you wanted to increase that up to four, um, you basically just go into the, the plan, expand the number of instances to four, and it would just redeploy them for you uh, and, and deploy the code automatically. So some tips to scaling out your web apps. 
So first of all, there's lots of options. So both with the instance sizes and with the databases, which we'll go through as well, there's loads of different options. So I would recommend starting off with something small and then experimenting with different sizes. You should do a, probably do a load test as well to check the performance of your application once you've picked an architecture that you're happy with. And with Locust IO, which is a free load testing framework, there's a sample on the, uh, the link at the bottom as well on how to use Locust with Django. But with Locust, you could say, okay, I want to simulate uh, 1,000 concurrent users or 10,000 concurrent users. Uh, and you can set up a test cluster and see how they respond. So I definitely recommend picking an architecture and then load testing the architecture. And then if you need to, scaling it back or scaling it up. So I'd also say favor a cluster of smaller nodes rather than um, one massive instance. Um, so in terms of scalability and also resilience, so if it crashes on one, for example, uh, and you have a failover, that's brilliant. Uh, but applications do tend to perform better uh, if you have more instances deployed. Uh, and we'll also go into some performance tips for that as well. And try and move as much of the load off the app uh, in the instance as possible through a couple of things. Template caching, Django has loads of options for caching. Um, probably one of the best options I think for this architecture is to uh, basically render your templates and then cache those in the database. So Postgres, which we'll come to, is a low latency, high performance uh, database service. And in terms of the latency to the instances themselves, it actually makes a pretty good option for caching. Um, so instead of using a uh, like a caching service as a separate thing, uh, Postgres actually would be a, just as performant to do the template caching or the front end caching. Uh, obviously you can cache lower down in the application if that's what you require, uh, but definitely recommend implementing caching and then moving static files out of the application uh, and onto a different service. So I think the the basic tutorials with Django and Azure um, use something called white noise, which basically delivers the static files through the application. Um, don't recommend that for, for anything bigger than a really small use case because um, you're basically sending all requests for hate, you know, static content like CSS files and JavaScript through Python. And Python's not really designed to, to do that. So there are better options, which we'll go through in this, in this talk. Something else is an, another tip is Django 3 supports asynchronous web workers using a standard called ASCII. So you might notice if you've made a Django 3 project, there's the whiskey.py file that it generates as a template. There's also an ASCII.py file that it generates. So in terms of the, the architecture components, the, the way you connect the HTTP service to, to Django would, used to be using whiskey. Uh, and when you deploy um, Django on Azure, it will automatically use the whiskey endpoint for Django you can reconfigure it to use the ASCII endpoint. Even if you're not using async yet, just using ASCII with Uvicorn can make your application faster. So there's some steps that we recommend in here. Basically to override the default settings to use WSGI for the application, you would add Uvicorn as a dependency and you'd uh, create basically the command to start GUnicorn with Uvicorn. Um, and I've given an example here of what that would look like. Again, that's in the sample repository. Um, but basically that says, this is how you should start Django with the ASCII endpoint using Uvicorn as the worker, um, and then GUnicorn as the front end. And that should actually add quite a lot in terms of performance to your, to your deployment. Cool. So Django doesn't really do much without a database. And there are lots of options again. Um, so I'll try and steer you towards the ones uh, that I think I recommend both in terms of what is supported and in terms of, you know, ease of use and ease of management going forward. So kind of the main one really is uh, Azure database for Postgres. So this is a managed Postgres database as a service. So basically Microsoft runs Postgres for you we run all the servers, we do the, the backups for you, we manage the memory, the CPU, everything. So Postgres has been uh, basically running on Microsoft infrastructure 
and we've tuned it for performance uh, and all you pay for is basically the uh, the number amount of compute that you need the amount of ram you need and the amount of storage that you need you don't have to worry about actually running the vms themselves you can do the same thing with Microsoft SQL Server using a service called Azure SQL. Uh, this is compatible with Django using the Microsoft SQL Server ORM driver. It's not one of the officially supported ORMs uh, databases for, for Django, but it is available through a different ORM driver. Uh, and then lastly, you can get Azure Database as a managed service for both MySQL and MariaDB. Um, both MySQL and MariaDB are fully compatible with Django as well. In terms of Django's database support, um, if you haven't picked a database yet, um, then my recommendation is to is to go with Postgres. I think it's um, really the most commonly used one in the community. Most commonly used means that the performance is good, it's been tested well, and if you have any issues with it, then it's likely someone has had that issue before you <laughs> and there's an answer to your question. I guess the more niche you go with the databases, then you know, you're gonna find situations where you can't get support or you can't find help. Microsoft offers Postgres, Maria, MySQL as fully managed databases. If you do need Oracle or SQLite, um, we don't offer those as a database as a service, but you can deploy them on a virtual machine and manage that yourself. Also, if you install third-party support for Django, um, you can also use Microsoft SQL Server or Cockroach, Mongo or Firebird. Um, Mongo, for example, you could either use um, a Mongo on a virtual machine or you could use Azure's Cosmos DB service, which has a Mongo interface, and then use a database connector called Django, which connects um, Django into MongoDB. Um, but again, like I suggested, if you stick with the standard path, um, it means you're less likely to come across uh, edge cases and issues in the future. Uh, and if you do, and you're sticking with Postgres, Maria or MySQL, then you know chances are someone else has hit that issue and has an answer for how to fix it. So if you are going with Postgres as the database engine, we basically have three um, different services for, for you, depending on the scale of what it is that you're looking to do. Uh, the standard one at the moment is called single server. So uh, there's a lightweight option, which is between one to 64 cores, uh, from five gig to a terabyte of storage. That's the storage of your database. It's also locally redundant. So that is already configured in a cluster for you. Um, and if you need to give your instance more CPU, for example, um, there's a scale up option. So that's for the single server. Then the other option is deploying it with Flexible. Uh, Flexible actually scales down even smaller. So if you have a really small requirement um, and you actually want to limit that this down to maybe one or two virtual cores and two or four gig of memory, um, the flexible lightweight option is really the cheapest option in this uh, in this grid. And then going up from there, we've then got general options, which would suit most use cases. Um, you can go from two to 64 cores. Um, with single server, basically we say how much uh, CPU you would get, and then the RAM basically depends on the size of the database. Uh, in general, also that there would be geo redundant. So we basically have a, a cluster across uh, different data centers. In the flexible mode, um, the storage goes from 32 gig up to 15 terabytes, um, but you can actually configure the, the memory available to you as well. So you might wanna check to see which is the best option if you know how much memory you need uh, between single and flexible. And you can do that by getting a price estimate when you go through the portal. So before you deploy it, it'll give you an estimate as to how much that's gonna cost on a monthly basis. If your database uses a lot of RAM, so a lot more RAM than it does CPU, it's called a memory optimized um, configuration in Azure. This is unusual. So if you've got a lot of store procedures in Postgres or if you're doing something in Postgres, which makes it very memory intensive, such as full text search, for example, or 
Um, you've got a ton of indexing going on on the memory side. Um, you might want to look at the memory optimized versions, um, especially with flexible that would go up to 432 gig of RAM. Um, if you need even more than this, <laughs> um, or actually if you really kind of, if your requirements don't fit these three models, then uh, we also have something called a hyperscale option, which is really for ultra high performance uh, in terms of latency. So if you need, um, you know, the smallest amount of latency um, between your web application and the database, and you have data needs beyond 100 gig, um, we have another option called Citus, um, which is a service that we offer, which basically enables Postgres to be scaled horizontally. So instead of just having one big database server, you can actually have multiple. Um, and that's configured in a ultra low latency option. So Citus is another option if you do have high performance requirements on your database. Um, and then probably even more niche, but if you have high performance requirements on your database, and also it has to run in your own infrastructure, um, then we have something else which is enabled uh, called Azure Arc for Postgres uh, hyperscale. So this is something you can run on your own infrastructure using Azure Arc. It's a lot of options. <laughs> um, but generally I'd say look at both single server and flexible, either lightweight or general, and look at your size of your database and how much memory you think you might need and pick the best option out of those four. Cool. Um, when you deploy Postgres, uh, you, you need to figure out how your web apps, um, all of your instances connect into the database. So uh, the best way to do that, this is an extra tip, is to create something called a network security group. This basically creates like a virtual network between the database uh, service and the app service plan so that all instances that you deploy at the web app can automatically connect into the database and you don't have to worry about adding the IPs uh, manually. If you do look at the firewall in uh, Azure for Postgres, there are two options which I don't recommend you select. Um, that one and that one. <laughs> uh, the first one says uh, automatically allow any IP address within Azure to connect to your database assuming they know the username and password. And the second one is just allow any IP address to connect. I don't recommend doing either of those two things for security reasons. Um, use a network security group instead. Okay, we talked a bit about static files at the beginning and how it's really not ideal to serve up static files through Python. Um, and if you were used to using Nginx and then delivering static content through Nginx, uh, we have even better options uh, than that. So with um, with Django on Azure, um, really, if you move the static files off the application and you put them onto either a CDN or onto Azure Storage, it will both improve the performance of the application, it reduce the load times, and it also reduce your cost. Uh, so Azure Storage is a, is a great cheap option. Um, in terms of the ways to do this, there's a package called Django Storages, which has an Azure option. If you add that to your requirements for your app, which is in the sample project, and you add storages to the list of installed apps, then all you need to do is basically create a couple of classes. Again, the examples are in the, in the sample project uh, to say what to do with both static files and media files in Django. So, the way that I suggest setting this up is um, the simplest way really is to create an Azure storage account uh, and then basically create an Azure storage blob in there. What will happen is when you deploy the application uh, to Git, um, to your Git server, and it includes all the static files, when it gets deployed onto the, the actual application, when you deploy the latest version, it will run Django's collect static uh, task Collect static will then upload all the static content to Azure Storage for you. So you don't have to worry about uploading the static files. Collect static will actually go and then upload that into Azure Storage for you. Uh, and then once you've configured it correctly, then on your front end, it will set the static URL to be the URL of Azure Storage. Uh, so the user doesn't actually see any difference. It just means that Azure Storage is serving up the content over HTTP.
Um, you can then go beyond that and actually look at an Azure CDN. Uh, so Azure CDN will basically improve the performance even further by replicating the content and caching it in different nodes uh, all across the globe. So if you do know that you have users uh, in multiple uh, in multiple countries or in different parts of the globe, or even between the east and west of the US, um, you can add Azure CDN, which will basically connect to Azure Storage and then cache any static files and any assets that you have in that storage blob uh, and cache them in all of our data centers. It will dramatically reduce load times um, and Azure CDN is something that's quite straightforward to set up as well. Uh, if you do use Azure CDN, there's uh, a tiny tip here for you. Um, this is basically a custom rule that you can configure so that when you've deployed Azure, uh, when you've deployed Django into Azure and you maybe changed a CSS file or you changed an image um, and you know that it's actually being cached on the CDN, if you use this rule here, um, basically what it will mean is if you do a hard refresh on your browser, you know, like a control F5 or a command shift R, for example, then it will send an extra header to the CDN and the CDN will then go and reload the, reload the cache for you. Cool. So once you've got all this deployed, um, every instance of Django will have its own logs. So, you know, if you had a, a crash or an exception or something that was unhandled, or you wanted to look at the logs for your Django applications, because you're running them on one, you know, possibly five, possibly even more instances, you really want to see that information in one place. So the best option for running Django on Azure is to use the Django middleware for open sensors. Uh, open sensors is an open source project for tracing uh, log information and log capture for Python. Uh, this is something that the Microsoft team actually contributes towards. So there is both a, a piece of Django middleware which connects into Django and connects all your Django logs, any failed requests. Uh, it adds information like stack traces and which view the user was using and all sorts of extra data. Um, if you use the Django middleware for open census and then you connect that into a service called Application Insights, then you basically have one interface and one database which has got a capture of all your logs, uh, any failed requests that you might have, uh, any exceptions and stuff like that. So if you get a report from a user to say, I hit an error on your site and it was on a Tuesday at two o'clock, you know, you could go in there and see exactly what they were doing, what the stack trace was, what caused the error. Uh, so it's going to give you all of that information. Another tip is um, there is the Python option, which I explained, but there's also an application insights extension for JavaScript. So if you add that to your main template in Django, um, then it's going to basically capture any client side information as well, like any JavaScript exceptions. It also gives you a lot more information about the browser information. So, you know, which browsers people are using, what the load times were, uh, whether they had any errors on JavaScript and whether there's any performance bottlenecks. It also gives you some geo uh, data of the users. So it tells you which countries they're coming from uh, and roughly which locations. So if you want to use that to optimize your app, um, you know, to a particular geography that you can also do that. Cool. So once you've got all that in place, um, you can also create a service dashboard. This is something that's just available uh, in Azure out of the box. So all the things we've talked about so far, you know, your web apps, your Postgres database, your app plan, you know, that emits data like CPU usage, memory usage, number of requests, response times, utilizations. So you can see all those graphs when you're in the Azure portal. Um, but you know, you'd have to hop around each different component to see the information. So something else you can do is just basically add a single dashboard and then go and pin all that information to the dashboard and see it in one place. So if you get a user complaining that the site is running slow, for example, or you're just wondering how things are performing in general, um, you can set up a dashboard and see all of that performance data um, in a single place. There's also an app for iOS called Azure Mobile. And in there, you can also uh, favorite a particular resource group. Uh, and you can see this information in Azure Mobile as well. So if you're on the run, 
um, or you get a call from a user maybe to say a uh, complaint about performance or something, you can check that uh, from your mobile. Cool. So when it comes to deployment and uh, DevOps, there's again, lots of options. I'll get asked you towards the, probably the simplest and then which are the most practical going forward. So uh, I guess the obvious one is to, is to deploy your code manually. So you can either do this from VS Code using the Azure extension. So one, if you have the Azure extension for VS Code, then you can connect that to your Azure subscription. And then from your app itself, from your Django application, uh, you can then basically do a deployment directly from VS Code and it will handle the uploading of the application files. It'll run the collect static task for you and it'll also do everything in terms of the whiskey configuration, deploying it to multiple instances. So really you've just got one button to click on to, to do the deployment from, from VS Code. You can also do something very similar using the Azure portal, connecting to something like a secure FTP server. So if you've got a workflow that prefers this, then um, you can do that through the portal. Uh, or lastly, you can do it through the Azure CLI. So you can actually deploy from the command line um, using the AZ CLI uh, that's available on uh, Homebrew or it's available on a few um, other sites as well. Then for automated deployment, um, again, plenty of options. There's GitHub Actions for Azure. So there's a GitHub Action to deploy a Python web app. So you can do that in your CI CD. Uh, you can use Azure DevOps um, with Azure pipelines for projects that are maybe are hosted on private Git servers. So GitHub Actions is great if your project is already hosted on github.com. Um, if it's on a private Git server, um, you can use Azure pipelines as the, uh, the deployment process. Instead, uh, same concept, uh, same options as well. So you can configure pipelines to deploy the code for you. Again, we've got samples for all of that in the in the link at the bottom. And then uh, lastly, if you have completely private infrastructure and you have your own CI CD process that you already have, maybe something like Jenkins or Bamboo, um, then you can use the Azure CLI on that CID, CI CD service to do the deployment uh, for you. My tip would be to start off with something simple. <laughs> um, all the automated deployments are awesome. And, you know, once you've got things up and running, definitely recommend going down that path. Um, but just start off with a manual deployment first, just to get the feel of things and understand how everything fits together. And then once you're comfortable that you've got your configuration right, um, then look at how you would do that in a, an automated fashion. Cool. So... There are some other services that maybe you have in your VM at the moment, which you're thinking, okay, how do I fit this all together? So an obvious one is, you know, your Django application might be using the uh, the Django system for sending mail. So probably the best option for this is a partner that we have in Azure called SendGrid. Uh, SendGrid is a basically mail as a service. So you can go in the Azure portal and type in uh, SendGrid and you can provision an account uh, with SendGrid and it gives you an API key um, and a username and then basically just copy these settings here uh, into your settings.py uh, and Django will automatically work and send all mail out through SendGrid. If you're using something like Celery to run scheduled tasks, maybe they are to send out a mailing, um, you know, like a, 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 a mailing list or something or a marketing email on a regular basis. If you're using Salary to do that now, um, probably a good option as a replacement would be Azure Functions. So Azure Functions, again, you can deploy from VS Code, but it's just a way of running a small snippet or a small piece of code. And that supports Python as well. Uh, in terms of how the code runs, once it's deployed in Azure Functions, you can create a timer trigger uh, or a HTTP trigger. If you did a timer trigger, you could say, okay, every Saturday run this piece of code. And the piece of code would be a Python function that would connect to Django via the database, um, run any query you needed and maybe sends out a mailer or something or it does some maintenance tasks or something. So anything you're using Celery for at the moment and then Azure functions should be a suitable replacement. So in summary, 
if we go back to the Django architecture, we've got app services, which would orchestrate the deployment of the actual code onto the instances and handles, you know, scaling up and down. Um, it also does the load balancing for you or the SSL and everything like that. The application instances are the actual nodes that run the code. Uh, they also serve up the HTTP endpoint and deal with the WSGI or the ASCII interconnect into Django for you. In terms of static files, then offload those into Azure Storage. So that would serve up all your static content uh, and then optionally deploy Azure CDN to replicate and deliver that globally. Use something like Azure Database for Postgres so that you can scale your database up from you know a few gigabytes up to whatever it needs to be. You can optimize the memory you have, the CPU you have, and all the backups and the redundancy are dealt with for you. And then connect all that together to application insights so that you can see uh, you know, a full log and record of everything that's happened on your app. And you can go back and trace through uh, any user issues or any failures, or you can even see insights into who's using your application and you know what their user journeys are and stuff like that. So some things to remember before we wrap up today. Don't over provision. <laughs> um, it might be tempting when you see all the options to think, okay, we're gonna go with something big. Um, I'd say run a load test before committing to an architecture. Uh, so like I suggested with both the instance sizes and also if you go with something like flexible Postgres, then start off with the, uh, the configuration that you think makes sense. Run a load test um, or even just keep it running in production for maybe a month. Uh, go back through the logs and you could look at the utilization and then if needed to, you can bring that down again. So that's the benefit of having this is that, you know, instead of a VM, you can scale that down uh, as you need to. And then if in future, you know, the use case goes up, um, then you can just increase the number of instances and you can allocate more memory to the database. So don't over provision is my big suggestion. You know, experiment with taking components, especially like static files off the application itself and offloading them onto something like the Azure storage and the CDN. Cache, cache, cache. Uh, template caching is brilliant. Um, caching in terms of your indexes and Postgres. So if you really want to get performance out of your application, look at all the different levels of caching that you have uh, configured in Django. Django caching is a topic in itself and we could talk, we could do an entire talk just about Django caching. Um, the tips I have really is that look at template caching um, and doing that in Postgres as being a, a high performance option. Um, instead of a standalone caching service, something like Redis, for example, um, Postgres would give you equivalent, equivalent performance and it's one extra, uh, one less thing to learn and it's one less thing to worry about. And test all your monitoring and error handling um, once you've deployed your application. So, you know, make sure that if it crashes that you can see exactly what happened and it's all been set up properly, don't wait for a user to complain to see if you've set up your logging correctly. So in conclusion, I think that Azure is a great place to run Django. There's loads of options and there's options which can scale with you. So whether that's from a tiny application all the way up to something that's got millions of users. And hopefully I've shown you today how you can use Azure to its fullest and you can really kind of leverage a lot of flexibility you get with Django and you can scale this thing up as and how you need to. Copy of the slides, all the resources, as well as links and extra reading information is available on this uh, link below, as well as a sample application we've put together. So we've actually got a Django application which has all of these best practices I've mentioned in there, as well as the, the DevOps scripts, the configuration options, like everything we've talked about today uh, is available there. So this isn't just you know how it should be this is actually how it can be and i'll you know kind of prove it in the in the code and the options for you so yeah if you do have any questions there's a couple of us around we also have a booth here and we'd be happy to answer any any questions you might have thank you very much goodbye <laughs>